One of the most commonly asked questions I've seen with these new Ugreen NAS units is how well you can run other OS's like TrueNAS, Unraid, Windows, Proxmox, and others. So in this video, I'm gonna try running different OS's and see how it goes. I'm also gonna take a look at a few other more technical tidbits like how the M.2 PCIe lanes are laid out, thermal throttling, how the power settings are set on the built-in CPU, and how you can use the little PCI Express slot on these larger six and eight bay modules. As a disclaimer, this video was sponsored by Ugreen to take a look at running different OS's on these units, and I've put a few links in the video description if you want to pick these units up on their Kickstarter page for a discount before the Kickstarter ends. Let's get started into running different OS's on these units. The really quick summary is you can run other OS's without really any major issues. There is a few things you're going to want to configure though. The first thing you want to do is get into the BIOS on this system. And in order to do that, you're gonna to wanna to press Control and F12 at the same time in order to enter the BIOS. You're gonna see a little menu like this, which will list all the boot options and also an option to enter setup. And you're gonna to wanna to enter setup on this system, which gets you a fairly normal BIOS looking menu on it. And the first thing you're gonna to wanna to change if you're gonna run any other OS other than the built-in Ugreen OS is going to be to turn off the OS watchdog. And if you go under advanced and then watchdog settings by default, it's gonna be set to enabled. You're gonna to wanna to select enabled and turn it to disabled. What that watchdog does is it checks if the Ugreen OS is running correctly. And if it isn't, it'll automatically reset the system. This could be a nice feature if it has a problem and it needs to be reset, but if you're running other OSs, it'll just force reset it three minutes into running. So you probably don't want that enabled. Other than that, you can leave basically everything else to the default, but since I'm in the BIOS, I decided to take a look around. On the screen now is gonna be a video of me going through all the different BIOS options, so pause it or play it slowly if you wanna see if that specific option you want is in there. It has most of the options I could want, but I wish they'd give a few more options, so there's no controls, for example, over virtualization like VTD or VTX, enabling things like advanced power limits for the CPU, it's just turbo boost on or turbo boost off, but you can turn on things like PXE boot if you want it, has a good amount of control over what your NVMe drives are and what the boot settings are. And it's a pretty normal OEM style BIOS that this system comes with. So I can now save changes and exit with my watchdog disabled and boot to my internal storage. One thing I do wanna note is Ugreen said that the built-in OS doesn't have a way to download it and do a recovery restore. So if you wanna get back to the built-in OS on these units, you're gonna to wanna to make an image of that 128 gigabyte built-in SSD onto some other piece of storage in case you need to DD it back for some reason and wanna to get to the OS. They also told me that the hardware warranty is gonna cover the system for three years, even if you install another OS and do whatever you want with the software. So you don't have to worry about the hardware warranty being affected by running something like TrueNAS or Proxmox on it. And when it comes to running different OSs, I tried running Windows, TrueNAS, Unraid, Proxmox, and a couple others. And the general summary is they all just work, basically. I put my USB installer in, it shows all my internal drives, I can install it onto the built-in 128 gigabyte M.2 NVMe drive, it installs without any issues, and I boot into the OS and use it. And essentially full functionality of all the ports and everything with a couple minor caveats. The first thing you might be able to see is these front little hard drive and LAN connections don't work and it just cycles through. Drivers wise, everything worked out of the box in my Linux based distribution. So for example, TrueNAS, Unraid and Proxmox. On the other hand, Windows acquired me installing the Aquantia drivers. So you want a little USB stick with those Aquantia AC107 network drivers or you want a little USB NIC so you can download it on the system and have the main NIC start working. Once those are set up, those network cards work just fine. And overall, when it comes to running OS, it says it's not too much else to talk to. It's just another x86 system with these specs. It's kind of nice that it works essentially fully out of the box, is fairly supported by Ugrain, and the BIOS doesn't really have anything locking me out or preventing me from making changes or doing something like I'd like. With that out of the way, let's take a look at this different six bay unit I had to play with for this video. The big most notable feature is you get two more drive bays. So that's up to 144 terabytes with today's largest 24 terabyte drives. It also has a few more changes, including a PCI Express slot that you can put any code you want to in it and a built-in AC power supply so there's no power bricks sitting out there. When they included a PCI Express slot, I immediately first started testing what all can I put in a slot and how well does it work in their included OS and other OSs. As far as the physical PCI Express slot itself, it's a Gen 8 with the end cutoff physical slot. So you could put like an X16 slot in or any smaller size if you'd like. 
Electrically, it's wired up for Gen 3 by 4. So you won't get the additional speeds of X8, but it is nice that you can put a larger card in it if you want for compatibility. Physically, it's a low profile single slot card. So stuff like a networking and PCIe SSDs are likely gonna fit fine, but you're not gonna put large graphics cards in the system, for example. And there is no easy way to get additional power to the slot either. When it comes to compatibility with the built-in OS, it's not great. Um, if I tried putting something like an additional SATA SSD using a SAS HBA, what it would do is it would just not recognize it in the OS, but it does show in the command line, so it is recognized. When I added an NVMe SSD, it would contest for one of the two M.2 slots. They didn't seem to have a way of recognizing an NVMe drive that wasn't in the M.2 slots. So when I put two NVMe M.2 slots in, as well as an NVMe PCI Express slot, I could only use two of them. And it seemed to be suited to add network cards because it would show my additional network cards in the PCI Express slot with the built-in 10 gig ones as a total of four NICs. But with a system with dual 10 gig, the need for additional network card goes down, but you could do something like 25 gig or put in like SFP plus NICs if you wanted to. As far as other OSs go, I can use whatever card I want in this slot without any issues. Storage cards work just fine. Network cards also work fine. I didn't see any compatibility problems or issues using any cards. The next question you might have is, what about graphics cards? Due to the space and power limitations, you can't fit most cards, but something like a GT 1030 or GT 710 will work just fine in the system, and you do get video out on the system. The annoyance is it does disable the onboard graphics, which means doing pass-through where you have the onboard graphics set up to do a like built-in diagnostics display of something like Proxmox or your hypervisor, and then the um, added GPU to do something like your OS of like Windows, for example, you can't do that. You have one GPU that you can use at any given time, and the BIOS doesn't have any visible to me options to change that, which is a little bit annoying. I'd love to see an option to run both the onboard graphics and the dedicated graphics at the same time on this system. The one other change that the 6-bay and 8-bay models have is they have dual Thunderbolt ports on the front of the system instead of 10 gigabit USB ports. I don't typically find myself using USB ports on a server like this too much, but the most exciting use I found to myself is I can plug it into something like a MacBook or something with Thunderbolt built in, and it just shows up as a Thunderbolt network card in Linux, and I can just have a about 13 gigabit connection in my experience between the laptop and this system in terms of networking. So I can pretty easily just take a Thunderbolt cable and have a one cable solution that connects my laptop to the system and charges about 15 watts and gives me about a 13 gigabit network link, which is a little bit cheaper and nicer than having to use something like a Thunderbolt to 10 gigabit connection and then connect it to the same switch or one of the ports on this node. One of the other things I wanted to look into on this system is how is PCI Express laid out on this board and how many lanes do each of these devices have? Unfortunately, Intel doesn't have as good of block diagrams for these 15 watt U processors as they do for their full-fledged desktop chips. And it also is different from desktop chips, so you can't just use those diagrams for this system. Taking a look at this basic block diagram that seems to be the best I can find, it shows those two X4 Gen 4 links and some Thunderbolt and doesn't show any other PCI Express. But taking a look at this system and taking a look at what LSPCI lists for the link speed of all these parts, I can see that the PCI Express slot here is likely a Gen 4 by 4. I could only run it at Gen 3 by 3 because I don't have a Gen 4 card that goes into it, but it likely is Gen 4 based off what I can see. And when it comes to the M.2 slots, one M.2 is a Gen 4 by 4, and the other M.2 is a Gen 3 by 2, as shown by LSPCI's link state and also by the bandwidth I'm getting when wanting FIO benchmarks. Here's a little diagram so you know which one is which. When it comes to the Ethernet controllers and the built-in SATA controller, all three of those have a Gen 3 by 2 link to them. And the internal SATA controller runs for the drive bays, whereas the other two drive bays are being ran by the SATA ports internal to the CPU. And it looks like these 12th generation mobile processors don't have enough PCIe lanes to run all the slots in here at their maximum bandwidth. That would be awesome to see on a box like this. I still think the amount of bandwidth is sufficient because these M.2 slots are all faster than 10 gigabit, though theoretically, if you're running the slower M.2 drive, you could run into limits when running both 10 gigabit connections. Unfortunately, practically though, I can't immediately off the top of my head think of a CPU that has all the same features and power consumption as this CPU here, but just has a few more PCIe lanes. And while using a PCIe switch would help a little bit when it comes to sharing bandwidth between these different devices, 
They're often quite expensive and power hungry, not something you'd want in a box like this. The next thing I wanted to take a look at is how Ugrin has the CPU set up when it comes to turbo boost and clock speeds and frequencies and how all of that is configured and how I can change it. In order to see how my changes had effects, I used Cinebench and Windows to see how the performance would be affected. The next thing is I took a look at the BIOS to see what options I had available to me there. And in their BIOS, I only had one option. Turbo Boost is either set to on or off. When Turbo Boost is set to on, it follows Intel's recommendations of a 55 watt short term power limit. After 28 seconds, the power limit will drop down to 22 watts forever. The temperatures at that configuration will shoot up to 100 degrees at 55 watt limit, and then will drop to about the mid 70 degrees with the default fan profile at 22 watts and continue running at that speed forever. When I turn Turbo Boost off in the system, it'll drop the frequencies to less than half of it with Turbo Boost at 1.3 gigahertz on the P cores and 0.9 on the E cores, pulling about five watts. It's probably a little bit too low and not a setting you wanna turn off in the BIOS. What if I wanna let it go faster and not have to be limited by that power limit? The first thing I tried doing was just seeing if more cooling would help by maxing out the fans. And it dropped the temperatures down to the high 60s, but didn't affect performance at all. If I want to raise power limits, I can use XTU and Windows and likely other tools and other OSs to raise those power limits as high as they can go. And it won't be power limited anymore. But in that case, what it would do is it'll run the CPU at 100 degrees. I got about 15% more multi-threaded performance in my testing, but the CPU would sit at about 100 degrees for the full duration of the test and pull about 32 watts on average being thermally limited. Now, this case doesn't give a ton of room for the CPU cooler to suck in air and get it. So I tried taking the motherboard out, running on an open test bench, letting it sit at 37 watts, getting a bit more power into it, giving it another little bit more performance. And if I tried giving it as much cooling as I could by taking a high speed fan and putting it on that heatsink, it would still sit at 100 degrees for that duration, but this time at 45 watts with a bit more power consumption. The default power profile is probably pretty decent as recommended by Intel and gives a pretty good combination of power efficiency and temperatures in this case, but I would have loved to see an option in the BIOS to raise those power limits, have a little bit better of a cooler installed for that extra 20% performance in multi-threaded tasks. In single-threaded tasks, it won't hit the power or thermal limit by default, so I won't get any improvement in single-threaded performance on this by tuning it. And with all of these test results over, let's go over just a few more thoughts on this Ugreen NAS lineup. I think I keep playing with it, and overall I'm pretty impressed as a NAS unit if you just want to use it as a piece of hardware to run your own OS on it. There's definitely a few tweaks that they could have done to make it a little bit more friendly that hopefully they bring to the public later on, like maybe changing these blinking LEDs to always work, um, making public releases of things like BIOS updates if they come out, but I can't really complain that much about using it. And there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of relatively low cost, low power, desktop sized NAS units that are pre-assembled out there. Things like the HP Micro Server have now died, Super Micro's had a few units, but there's not that many and this unit puts itself in a pretty good position I'd say in that market. Now there's also the DIY market you can look at. And cases like the John's Bow N2 have come out and looked at as quite a good solution if you wanna go the DIY route. DIY gives a lot more options and it's hard to make a full comparison. If I compare every feature, this system looks like a really good value because things like Thunderbolt, dual 10 gigabit, dual M.2 can be a hard combination to find on a lot of off the shelf ITX boards, but you might not need that. And that is the great advantage of going with a DIY system. But there also is something nice to be said about having all these features built in and a warranty, which this system gives you. It's really up to what you want and a lot of different people want different things and different bits of hardware. But if you're looking for something like a pre-built, low power, small piece of hardware to run any OS on it, this system is pretty easy to set up and use. Let me know what your thoughts of running other OSs on the system or if that's interesting to you in the comments below. And thanks for watching this video.